Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Thank you for joining the Empowerment Zone. I am your host, Ramona Houston. Hello, listeners. We are here today with Victoria Archibald. Uh, she is a certified senior advisor and owner of the uh, of Care Patrol of Metro Atlanta, which is a senior referral and placement company. As a member of the Society of Certified Senior Advisors, Victoria is equipped to provide more value and a higher level of customer satisfaction to seniors by understanding and respecting the unique physical, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the aging process. Driven by a passion to help families struggling with the complex and stressful process of figuring out what to do with their loved ones, Victoria opened her health patrol office over three years ago. So she is a health care provider as well as an entrepreneur. Welcome, Miss Archibald. I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Well, thank you, Ms. Houston. May I call you Ramona? Yes, definitely. Okay. definitely. Uh, and please call me Victoria or Vicki. Um, it is so good to be with you this morning, and I'm excited to have a, some time to speak with your audience and, and just excited about what you're doing in this space and getting the word out to your, to your audience and to the community about uh, the aspects, the different aspects of the aging process and how we can support seniors as they age. Yeah, Thank so you. uh, so um, you're in the field of helping people when they age. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got in this profession? Absolutely, I would love to. Um, so let me make one correction. I think the information that I sent you needs to be updated. I've actually been doing this work for over six and a half years. Okay. I um, opened my office in February of 2014. Care Patrol is a national placement company. Uh, it's been around for over 25 years. And there are about 150 offices nationwide. And I opened my office in, in 2014. So almost seven years. Uh, I'm a certified senior advisor. And I just recently became a certified dementia practitioner. So I wanted to get a lot more training and education around um, helping families with loved ones who have dementia or, or as a form of dementia. Uh, that, is, that is a disease that is running rampant in our community, both across the board, regardless of, of racial background. Um, it's, 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 it's a critical issue right now in our community. So I wanted to arm myself with more knowledge in that area. My background started out, uh, I, I attended, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Memphis. So I started out in business. I started out working initially for the Procter & Gamble company as a sales representative in Memphis. Uh, I went on to uh, subsequently get my MBA from Atlanta University, and yes, uh, and uh, which is now Clark Atlanta University, um, and uh, moved into the area of, of product management or brand management. Uh, I did that work with the Ralston Karina Company in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, then left there and went to work for the Pillsbury Company and subsequently with, um, ended up with ConAgra. So my corporate career spans about 23 years and mostly in the sales and marketing arena. And then in uh, early 2001, I decided I wanted to become a business owner and I wanted to hopefully take a lot of what I had learned um, in the corporate world and apply that to running my own business. So I was living in, in Ohio at the time and I purchased a small 
um, millwork, custom millwork company that we made um, architectural casework or cabinetry uh, for commercial use. And I ran that business for about six and a half years up until the huge financial um, recession that we had in the late, uh, in, in 2008 and 2009. Um, and then I went, I, I closed that business and went to work for an office furniture dealership also, but I stayed in construction. So I, I was in the construction business for about 10 years, quite a dr dramatic turn from consumer products in, in corporate America. Um, but then I found myself uh, in 2013 kind of looking for a new opportunity. And it was becoming clear at that point, and probably before then, that our population, our, our seniors, or you know, the population in this country was, was starting to age. Uh, we're living longer, more baby boomers were turning, you know, are turning 65. I think there's something like 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every day. And that trend will continue to grow and expand. Um, the, the 65 plus population is estimated to almost double by the year 2035. So for a lot of reasons, I felt like this was an industry that really had a lot of opportunity uh, for a business or to get into business. And so I found Care Patrol through a franchise broker and uh, it it met a lot of the things that I was looking for. I you know I checked off checked off a lot of the boxes that I had a, a, as far as a business, and I uh, subsequently purchased a franchise. And I moved here to back here to Atlanta. I had lived in Atlanta twice before. Moved back to Atlanta and opened my business in 2014. So that's that's kind of a long explanation. <laughs> to how I got here. Yes, and it tells, you know, uh, about your background and skills in business and why you would be interested in uh, being a franchisee of Care Patrol. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, talk about some of the challenges that exist? Uh, we, as you know, we're focused on the African-American and uh, Latino American experience and the empowerment of our communities. What are some of the uh, themes that you find in terms of our experiences with aging and the challenges mm -hmm. we have and why the services you provide are so important. And then secondly, what should our communities be planning for? How should we plan? You know, uh, what are the solutions that you would give our community for um, dealing with the issue of aging? Yes. So the issue, or I'd like to say the opportunity of aging really crosses all racial barriers, or crosses all ra racial uh, um, barriers. Uh, it's not, it's not a, a situation that's unique to African Americans or Latinos. However, I think African Americans and Latinos have a unique situation in that and I and I and I honestly I don't want to speak as an expert for the Latinx community because I'm not an expert. I am African American, and about half of my clientele is African American. So I'll kind of focus most of my comments on on the African American community and what I've what I've seen, what I've observed, what I've witnessed over the last six and a half years. Um, we and and. and Honestly, none of this information is new, but we do tend to have and occupy a large percentage of what I will call the 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 you know one of the five chronic healthcare uh, comorbidities that that we see across the, the nation: heart disease, uh, diabetes, kidney disease, high blood pressure. And and of course, I probably dementia is has has started to is probably occupies the fifth area in that in that in that group. Um, so we are we are more prone to be challenged with those really chronic healthcare concerns and issues than say our Caucasian brothers and sisters. So we so we start out, we, you know, we're more likely to have diabetes. We're more likely to have, suffer with high blood pressure or heart disease, cardiovascular disease. And 
we tend to have um, more challenges just accessing the healthcare um, arena, you know, whether it's because we don't have good healthcare insurance or we don't have access to good healthcare insurance, whatever the, the case may be, we, t- or we just don't take the time to, to, to go and get the regular checkups and, and, and do those things that to, to keep, to manage, you know, our, our health. We tend to be, and I would say we overuse the healthcare system, you know, based on, you know, as a percentage of, of, of the entire population. Having said all that, I think that one of the things that we see in what I do, and, and let me just say, we strictly, ha- what, what our, our sort of, you know, stake in the ground is, is to really try to assist the families in finding the right care for their loved ones, for their aging parents or their aging uh, loved ones. So that care may be uh, placed out of home in an assisted living community or a personal care home or in a memory care community, or it may be uh, helping them access in-home care where they where the, the, their loved ones stay in the home and the care comes into them. Either way, um, what I often find is we don't, we don't necessarily, we being African-Americans, don't necessarily start planning earlier enough for our age, you know, for the care that we will need as we age. And we all know that as we age, you know, things are going to change. You know, our health is going to change as we age. We're either going to have some some physical health challenges or some mental health challenges, i.e. dementia. So what I'd like to say to your audience, if, if they don't take anything away from what I from what we talk about today is if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, it's never too early to start putting a plan in place. And what does that plan look like? Well, first of all, we need to have a designated durable power of attorney. If we are a parent or or sibling, uh, we need to have someone designated as a power of attorney. Why is that important? Because as we age, If no one is designated as a power of attorney, there are limitations to the help that you can get. In other words, you know, the healthcare healthcare industry, honestly, because of HIPAA laws, aren't really required to have a conversation, even if you are a spouse or, or, or an adult child, about your parents' health situation if you're not if you do not have a medical power of attorney. So that's the first thing I tell people when I when we have conversations. What I often see too is when, when we start talking to families or the adult children, a lot of times their parents have some kind of cognitive deficit, whether it's dementia or schizophrenia or bipolar disease, whatever it is, mostly it's dementia. Um, once that process starts to happen, technically that person isn't legally able to sign any kind of document. So if you don't have a power of attorney in place prior to that that disease taking hold, then it's going to be difficult to get it done after that. So please, 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 your audience, please, and and honestly, I don't care what age you are, everybody should have a durable power of attorney in in place. But that's one of the first things. And, And really before that, it's just the whole idea of sitting down with somebody if you are a parent and uh, you're 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 becoming more, uh, you're, you're you know you're coming moving into the retirement years or the aging or, or getting older, sitting down with your adult children and talking about what your your wishes are. You know, I mean, we're all going to get older if we're blessed to live. We're all going to get older. It's not. It's not. It should not be. Um, any, it, there should not be the difficulty around having the conversation. You know, what do you want? You know, how do you want to see your, how do you want to live your retirement years? Do you want to live at home? You know, for most people, they want to live at home, and that's perfectly understandable, and that's perfectly fine. But what do you need to put in place in order to make that 
that that doable and and safe. So maybe it means that you have to modify the home if it's a if it's a, if it's a you know a dual level home and there's stairs and all the bedrooms are upstairs. Maybe you have to put in a stair lift. Maybe you have to set up a, put a space downstairs and and turn that into a bedroom. Maybe you have to put in a walk-in uh, or a roll-in shower in the home. It's just sitting down and, and putting pen and paper together and having conversations about what, what will that look like if I can no longer take care of myself, if I am you know, physically or mentally impaired, what, what, do, what are my wishes? How do I want my family to, um, to handle the, making those decisions on my behalf? That's really key is having that conversation. Many people avoid having a conversation as if not having a conversation means they won't age and they won't get sick. That's just not reality. We will age and we will most likely fall into ill health. And so having a plan in place is so important. Um, I think having a plan in place, designating somebody as power of attorney, um, being financially ready <laughs> for, you know, the, for aging and for all the things that come along with that, you know, looking at, you know, your savings and maybe purchasing, looking at purchasing long-term care insurance. Because the reality is a lot of people who want to stay at home, if, they're ch if they have children, most likely those children are working. Uh, most likely those children have their own family, their own children, and they, you know, and they're, they're really stressed to now have to care for mom or dad or mom and dad, while they're also trying to raise their own families and they're trying to work. Um, so we have to be responsible in our, you know, what I call our earning years to put something back, to put something aside in anticipation of, of a time when we're not working, we can't work, and we may need a little extra income to help pay for that care. Um, so looking at our financial portfolio, making sure we have monies put aside or set aside for paying for care as we age. And, you know, if we don't need it, then, you know, will it to your grandkids or your great grandkids, you know, but the idea is oftentimes we get in, we get caught up in the healthcare system or when they come with, when, when, when families come to us, they have not, they don't have a plan. They haven't planned. Uh, there hasn't even been a discussion about what to do with mom or dad. Um, and, you know, no one's been designated as power of attorney. I, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with adult children who say, well, we don't, we're not the power of attorney and we're not on mom's checking account. So we don't really know how much money she has coming in. We don't really know how much money she has in the bank. Um, I, I get that, that as we age, we don't want to give up our independence. And we, we hear that all the time. Oh, I don't want to give up the independence. But the reality is, and, and I always say, it's not giving up independence. It's actually making, creating an environment where you can, you can hold on to independence because now you have a group. I was, I always liking it to, uh, it takes a village. And you know, we talk about it, We yeah. use that term when, with raising children, but it, it also takes a village when we have aging loved ones. We need, we need people around us that can support us. And, um, and the best way to do that is to have those conversations while, you know, we used to, we say in the old Baptist church, while we're still clothed in our right mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm so glad you shared that, uh, uh, shared the, this advice with our audience, because many times we don't want to discuss aging. No. And, we don't, and because we're all consumed with our other priorities, that tends to be put in, in the background. And you talking about how we need to have multiple types of, of support and resources, right? Mm -hmm. Financial mm -hmm. resources, and like you said, the community, your family. Yes, and yes. It, so that you can live the type of lifestyle you want to live. Exactly. Because a exactly. lot of times people are forced into situations where 
they don't want to be, but they they correct. haven't created any options. So you're That's correct. educating us on how do we create options. And then simultaneously talking about, you know, we need to deal with our own health care, right? Yes. So that we don't yes. have these uh, um, chronical, uh, I mean, cr- cr- um, critical health problems, you know, as we grow older. Yes. You know? Chronic yes. health problems, excuse me, chronic health. Yes. And, um, and, and also uh, that we also need to, to really learn how to navigate through the healthcare system. That is um, correct. And, and that is correct. we can have the, uh, you know, the type of healthcare that we need to support us. So I really, I enjoyed our conversation. This was a great conversation. If any of my audience would like to get in touch with you, uh, how would they get in touch with you if, if they wanted to uh, use, use your services uh, in terms of the care patrol? Absolutely. So my phone number is 404-583-1231. And our website is www.metroatlanta.carepatrol.com. Um, they can email me at v Archibald. that's V as in Victoria, A-R-C-H-A-B-L-E, at carepatrol.com. Yes. Thank you. And uh, her information, her website will also be on my website uh, the, uh, on Podbean if you want to contact Miss Victoria Archibald. Thank you so much for joining joining us today. It was thank you, Ramona, to you and teaching us all about the aging process and how we can become more empowered as we grow older. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Welcome. Today we're talking about strategies for college success, and I am delighted that I have Miss Victoria Archibald here as our guest, and she's going to give us a strategy for college success. She's a graduate of the University of Memphis, where she received her BA in business, and she also graduated from Atlanta University, which is also my alma mater, Clark Atlanta University, where she received her master's in business administration. So I know she's just so eager to give us a piece of advice to ensure that you are more successful in college. Welcome, Ms. Archibald. Thank you, Dr. Houston. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to speak with your audience. Um, Obviously, I am a big fan of education. I really think that that is critical to our community and really uh, moving our community forward. Uh, I was blessed to be able to obtain two degrees, and uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I would, my suggestion would be for college success, because obviously people go to college in order to gain the knowledge and the credentialing to advance their career of choice. Um, So one thing I would recommend if you're in college is while it's important to um, get good grades and attend classes and do all the things that, that, that will ensure your success in getting your degree, it's also important to have extracurricular activities in your experience, in your college experience. When I was an undergrad, I decided that I wanted to pledge a sorority. And through that, I gained a lot of leadership skills. Uh, I I was president of my local chapter in my senior year, and that taught me some leadership skills. And it also was something that the recruiters looked at when they looked at my resume. I could demonstrate that I had been a leader while I was matriculating in college. So, I, you know, sorority, Greek life is not for everybody, but I would encourage your audience to find something in during their college uh, experience that they are interested in, passionate about, and get involved because Again, recruiters look at more than just the coursework and your grades. They also want to see how active you were while you were there, if you had any leadership positions in any organizations. Um, 
respect. And I think that's that's important to have along with the grades and, and the coursework. Yes. So thank you for that advice. Participate in extracurricular activities. They are so important to your development as a leader. Thank you, Ms. Archibald. Thank you. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry Gully, theme song. Nad Works, digital support. And of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.